You know, the thing is that people look for signs and wonders. Pastor Ron and I were talking a little bit about that this morning, how people want signs and wonders, and that's what God gave them through Christ, right? He gave them signs and wonders. And remember the Pharisees said, show me a sign and wonder, and Jesus said, uh, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after signs and wonders, and the only one you're going to get from me is the, the sign of Jonah. Right? Jonah was the only prophet that he ever compared himself to. Because that incident with Jonah is exactly what we need to know about who Jesus is. For four little chapters, four chapters, and there he is. From the beginning to the end, Jesus is there in his fullness. Well, you know, looking for signs and wonders still happening today. People want to decide whether or not Christianity is real, whether or not the Bible is real, uh, by looking for signs and wonders. But the one who's willing to give you a sign and wonder anytime is the devil. And he can give you signs and wonders. He really can. And invariably, those signs and wonders tend to feed the carnal nature. They really do. Well, I'm here to tell you that the only thing that can really convince the truth that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Nothing else will do it. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It really is. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is absolutely alive, and it's beyond human ability to reproduce. It is of supernatural origin. You hear me say that over and over again. I want it to sink in. I can back that up any number of ways. And I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people throughout history have been able to, particularly in the last couple of hundred years, there have been quite a few people who've been able to tell us from so many different angles that the Word of God is beyond human ability to reproduce. Yeah. Mathematically, there's a Russian mathematician who was educated at Harvard uh, who decided that, you know, I guess he found out that there was some mathematical connection between the scriptures and reality. And he started to do just that, check out the mathematical qu quality of the scriptures for the rest of his life. And it's amazing what he came up with. His name was Ivan Panin, and you can check him out on the internet. Ivan Panin, uh, he found that the Bible is a mathematical construct beyond anything else. Nothing else comes close. It's philosophically, it's better than any philosopher has ever been able to come up with. In every way, the Word of God is beyond human ability to reproduce. It's a supernatural document. And when you really get stuck into it and you start to study it without bias, but wanting to know the truth at all costs, even if the truth is bad. I mean, if you're a truth seeker, you're willing to accept even a truth you don't like, right? Am I right? Well, if you approach the Bible that way, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna smack dab into Jesus Christ. That's where you're going to smack. And, and so what we need to do is understand that the Bible tells us what is true and what is not true. I say filter everything you think is true through the Word of God and you'll find out what truly is true. Because only truth will come to the other side of the Word of God. Amen? The preacher sought to find out, accept the words, and that which was written was upright, even with truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I call today's sermon, Creator or Created? Question mark. Is he creator or is he a created thing? John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Ah, 
John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. Ah, Romans 8, uh, sorry, Romans 1, verses 22 to 23. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Who, Romans 1, 25 says, exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. There's no denying it. Man has created God in his own image. Why? Because man wants to be his own, his own master. You know, the thing is that we're not qualified to be masters. The God that man creates. It's a God designed to serve man. It's a God, it's a God designed to keep man exactly where man is. Because man likes to be where he is. Have you ever noticed there's so many people don't want to try this Jesus out because they're satisfied with who they are. And our culture is only too happy to continue to make them think that way, right? You know, there is no truth apart from what you want to believe. That's the way the culture is right now, isn't it? The only truth that exists is the one you want to believe. I mean, your truth is because my truth, oh wait a minute, unless I'm in a better position than you. And now my truth is better than your truth, right? Yeah. This is a man-made God that Nicholas Van Hoffman calls the great mush god. Some of you have heard this before. I've talked about the mush god before. And I quote, the mush god has been known to appear to millionaires in golf courses. He appears to politicians at ribbon-cutting ceremonies and to clergymen speaking the invocation on national TV at either Democratic or Republican conventions, both of them. The mush god's presence is felt during Brotherhood Week and when Rotarians or Elks or other such fraternities come together. He is a lifeless deity, eager to serve all without regard to what is real or true. He is the great mushy one. The mush god has no the theology to speak of, being a cream of wheat divinity. The mush god has no particular creed, no tenets of faith, nothing that would make it difficult for a believer or non-believer alike to lower his head when the Reverend Rabbi Muff, Father Mufti or so-and-so will lead us in an innocuous, homeless, uh, harmless prayer. For this God of public occasions is not a jealous God. You can even invoke him to start a hooker's convention and he, she, or it won't be offended. God of the Rotary, God of the Optimist Club, protector of the buddy system, the mush God is the lord of secular ritual, of the necessary but hypocritical forms and formalities that hush the divisive and the derisive. The mush god is a serviceable god whose laws are not chiseled on tablets but written on sand, open to amendment, qualification, and erasure. This is a god that will compromise with you, make allowances, and declare all wars holy and any type of peace hallowed. Mush god's in the highest position in the land today. You know, when somebody claims to be a Christian and is perfectly willing to violate everything that Christ stands for, come on. He doesn't know Christ. He knows the mush God. 
He is a member of the great mushy ones family. This mush god is the permissive plastic god that tries to eclipse the one who was, who one who is, and the one who is to come. And who is that? Yahweh, Yahweh, Yadhe Vavhe. And what has the mush god to show for himself? What miracles has he performed? Where are the signs of ex his exploits on earth? Where has he recorded great words of wisdom that assure stability and hope in times of great stress and disaster? In fact, he does the opposite. He leads us into unrighteousness. He leads us into disorder. He leads us into chaos and decay. How many times do we have to do that before we wake up and realize who this mushy one is? And when we realize that, are we going to have the courage to stand up and say, no, mushy one, not interested in what you have to say, because I listen to the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. But some will say, oh, wait a minute, this is the God of the Bible, isn't it? Well, you know, what Bible are we talking about? Certainly not the one I read. This formless, impotent God has no bones. It is an empty balloon, a cloud without waters, appearing to have substance but collapsing under its own weight. And the mush God can be compared to the apostate and false teachers of Jude 1, verses 12 to 13. In fact, the mush God is one of the deities of the apostate church. Now, I say that again. The mush God is one of the deities of the apostate church. What church am I talking about? Apostate. Apostasis means to fall away, to be apart. And unfortunately, the church has a lot of apostasy in it today. Unfortunately, some of the very largest churches, there was one we talked about not too long ago, 5,000 people in that church, and the pastor stands up and says that Jesus is not the only way to God. And he calls himself a Christian and a pastor. Oh boy, God help him. God help him. Yes, there's a lot of apostasy now. So this is what they're like. These are spots in your love feasts while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, forming or foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Apostate pastors, wake up. Wake up. Before your sleep is forever. Now let's listen again to how the God of the Bible describes himself to us. He tells us that he is the unique creator of the universe in Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created them. They didn't just come into existence. He created them. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You know that God hovered over me for years? in my dark waters and waited for me to say, where are you, God? And that's when he said, let there be light. Let there be light. And then the light of understanding flooded my soul. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He identifies himself as the one who is without beginning and gave a beginning to everything that is. God is the one without beginning or end, but he gave beginning to everything that there is. <clears throat> he is what theology calls the uncaused cause. No matter what theory we accept, 
for the origin of everything, we still collide with the God of the Bible or get caught up in infinite regression. If we spin off into speculation about extraterrestrials, intelligence seeding the earth, or manipulating our history, we still run into infinite regress. What's infinite regress? Very simple. If you want to say that God did not create the universe, then what did? How did the universe come into existence? And if you want to say, well, it was a by accident, well, how can you prove that it's by accident? You really can't. But you know, what people want to say is that there's some other reason for its existence than God. But whatever you decide might be the cause of creation, you've got to go back to a creator. And if you say that the creator is ET, for example, extraterrestrial intelligence, then you've got to say, then who created them? And whoever created them, you've got to say, who created them? That's what infinite regress is. You keep going back and back and back and back and back. So, if you want to escape infinite regress, you have to take it on faith that God is the creator. And when you take it on faith, you do exactly what Anselm said in the 12th century, I do not seek to understand in order to believe, but I believed that I might understand. For this I know, if I do not believe, I will never understand. You've got to start somewhere. You start with, maybe the Bible is true. I will check it out. And until you do that, you will never understand the truth. Never. And hundreds, maybe thousands of people, maybe millions, have discovered that if you actually put God to the test by studying his word, you find him. No matter what or who may have created us, somebody had to have created somebody, and so on. For many years, I was fascinated by the various theories of extraterrestrial intelligence visiting and their supposed appearances in the Bible. You'll hear that, right? But after years and years of thoughtful consideration, I have learned that there are no references to E.T. in the Bible, only word pictures that have been misinterpreted and misunderstood by those who are unfamiliar with biblical language and symbology. Anybody who is, who is willing to make an unbiased and in-depth study of the Bible will discover that the integrity of the Bible is nothing short of astounding. Be assured, there is no E.T. connection with God. You know, Eric von Däniken, you remember who he is? He was a Danish... Uh, hotel owner, I believe. He wrote the book Chariots of the Gods. I was in New Zealand working as a policeman when he wrote that book. And I was in New Age at the time. I thought, oh man, I gotta get this book. So I was convinced. I thought he really had something to say. Um, he uh, used some things from the Bible that seemed to indicate extraterrestrial visitation. Right? One of the big, one, big ones was in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is by the, by the Kiba River, and uh, he's visited by God uh, in a chariot of fire. And he put, pulled another one out where uh, Elijah is taken by God in a chariot of fire. And, you know, it's really easy to come to these conclusions if you don't understand how God uses symbology in order to explain things that are deeper than our human experience, right? So there is no ET connection shown in Chariots of the Fire. Of fire. And the TV series Ancient Aliens, I love to watch that show. How many watch, how many watch Ancient Aliens? One, two, three. Two, three, 
Yeah, I love that show. You know what I like about it? The photography is wonderful. Is it not? They take us places that you know you would never visit any other way than watching that show. You find out things that they think back up their theory of extraterrestrial involvement in our history, but actually back up the word of God that says that we were created by God as very powerful beings who fell away from him. And some of the things that they're showing that they say, look, this is by extraterrestrial uh, conditioning or ability, these huge structures that have been made and everything, but they don't understand. Just for one example, the pyramids of Egypt. We all know about the pyramids of Egypt. Where'd they come from? And we hear about, well, they were built uh, by such and such a pharaoh at such and such a time. But you know, years ago, before Egyptology became really very, very popular, which was in the 20s, 1920s, uh, before that, they were asked, where did the pyramids come from? You know what the answer was? They were here when we got here. Isn't that interesting? So here's the thing. You look at the Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx and the pyramids are in a desert, right? Yeah. And yet, there is water erosion around the Sphinx. Now, how did that get there? Huh? Because it wasn't rain. I'll tell you how it got there. It's because there was a flood. And that flood separated what happened before and what happened afterwards. Before the flood, people lived to a tremendous ages. Can you imagine living to eight, and nine, eight to nine hundred years? You know, we start to decline after 40 or 50 or 60 years, don't we? Imagine being productive with a very high intelligence and a tremendous civilization Imagine what you could do. All those things that they attribute to extraterrestrials, I do believe, were done by pre-flood man. But they say it was extraterrestrial. I say it was pre-flood man. They were super smart, super strong, and lived a long, long time, and they knew things that we're only starting to find out about today. You go back and you start to look, and it sure does seem like they had a technology at least as good as ours today and possibly in excess of what we have today. So, ancient aliens is fun to watch, but their hypothesis is pure nonsense. There is no ET connection with God. God is exactly who he says he is. He calls himself El Shaddai, which means almighty in strength, that he can do whatever he wills without effort, that he does the greatest thing as easily as he does the least. This makes him different from all other beings. In Genesis 17.1, Verse 1, the Lord, appeared, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Already we begin to see that God, God is the leader, not the follower. He is the leader. In Genesis 14, verse 18, he calls himself El Elyon, God Most High. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the prince of God most high, El Elyon. There is none above God. He is supreme. He is unchangeable, immutable. You know, that makes him reliable. You know that? He never changes. So we can count on him. We don't have to second guess him, you know. He is not capricious, changing his mind on a whim. He is eternally the same in person and character. In fact, 
He is the very definition of perfection. We toss that word perfect around, but actually it is an absolute and it belongs to none but God. He alone is perfect. In Genesis 16 verse 13, he is El Roy, the God who sees me. He is omnipresent and omniscient. He is everywhere and he knows everything. Daniel 2 verse 22 says that even what has been done in darkness will be exposed by his light. In Exodus 15 verse 2, he records his name as Yah, which means the self-existent one. The self-existent one. His strength, he is strength and salvation. And in Genesis 15, 2, he reveals, reveals himself as God, our sustainer, Adonai, which means the Lord and master, the Lord, Yahweh, yad he vav he yad he vav he which means he is the creator of everything that is. The Lord. You know, that word Lord, I was asked many years ago, Somebody asked me, what does Lord mean? It was in, in my church in Florida. What does Lord mean? You know, I never thought about it before. But it made me wonder, yeah, what does Lord mean? So I looked it up. If you go to a, a, a dictionary that tells you the origin of words, you find out an awful lot about what words mean. And this is an old English word that means the provider of the loaf. The provider of the loaf. In other words, the one who gives you bread, right? He is the one who sustains you. He is the one who provides that which is, that's needed for life and godliness. That's what Lord is. Now, you know, there are lords in the world. And think about a landlord. There are two types of landlords. One of those landlords will sacrifice the people on his land in order to keep his land. Another will sacrifice his land in order to help the people who are on it. You see the two different, di different lords? See, Satan, as Lucifer, was called a lord. You know? But that was one who would sell you out in order to keep his position. But Jesus, not, Jesus is not the brother of Lucifer. Don't let any Mormon can tell you otherwise. He is not. But Jesus is the one true Lord who sacrificed himself Amen. for you and me. Amen. He is Adonai. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that we get the word adorable sounds very much like Adonai to me. He is our adorable master. And that title, Adonai, carries with it a sense of rulership and the taking on of responsibility for the ones in his charge. He takes on the responsibility for us. In Genesis 22, verse 14, Abraham learned that God is Jehovah Yireh, you hear it, Jehovah Jireh, but there is Jehovah Jireh, and he is the Lord who provides. He is Lord. He provides. He never asks us to do anything that he does not equip us in, to do. And Psalm 103, verses 1 to 3, declares him to be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, the Lord who restores. In ancient Hebrew, in an ancient Hebrew document, we learn that his people knew him in the temple as Elia Shaddai El Elyon Adonai. Elia Shaddai El Elyon Adonai, the one and only living God, the mighty, self-existent, almighty, most high Lord. That's what that means. The mighty, self-existent, almighty, most high Lord provider. 
He is the one that Jesus taught us to call our Father, the good, good Father, who provides for us, protects us, gives us hope and a future. He is the one that Jesus taught us to call Father, and throughout, the genera throughout Genesis, God identifies himself as the plural one, Elohim, Elohim, which is really talking about Echad, which means unity. Echad, unity, where two or three together make one. That's what Trinity is all about. It's the three who make one, that one being unity. But also it's Yachid. Yachid in the Hebrew means the one and only the one and only. And as you've heard me say on more than one occasion, you want to know what the Trinity is? People make a big deal out of this. Let me tell you, it's one God with three hats. His Father hat, His Son hat, His Holy Spirit hat. Simple. Nothing difficult about that. He is one God in unity. And you know what? When we're in His family, we're part of that unity. We are echad when we're in his family. It wasn't until the prophet Isaiah that we would begin to understand the concept of the triune God, Holy Trinity. We see it in Isaiah 9, 6 that tells us, for unto us a child is born. To us a, sin, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Holy Spirit, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, God the Father, Prince of Peace, God the Son. Ooh, all three in one there. How about that? And I would add 1 Timothy 3.16 to that. It declares, and without controversy, without argument, great is the mystery of godliness. Godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. And that is Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Every one of those. Jesus was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was justified in the spirit. Jesus was seen by angels. Jesus preached among the Gentiles. Jesus believed on in the world. And Jesus received up into glory. The Almighty One would show his strength and integrity in an act of supreme loving kindness as he took on the limitations of the flesh and revealed himself to us as the man Jesus. He took on the limitations of the flesh. You know, you think about Superman. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Can fly. Can go into outer space. You know, what can stop him? Only kryptonite, I guess. But nothing could stop him. Jesus, even greater than that, and put that all aside to become one of us. Think about that. You talk about demotion. The Almighty One. In Jesus of Nazareth, God revealed himself as love incarnate. The God who cares enough to subject himself to the horrors of physical pain and suffering of the cross so that man could live forever in a place of never-ending delight, which is in the presence of that one who died in my place. You know, talk about heaven, pearly gates, and all that stuff. Nah, put that aside to be in the presence of this wonderful, marvelous, and astoundingly loving God. That's my idea of heaven. Not a place, but a person. Amen. In God's word, we find Jesus as the mighty God. Now, I could give you the scriptures here, but I'm not going to because we're running out of time here. 
the mighty God, Jesus. God my Savior, Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. The Lord, Jesus. Our blessed hope, Jesus. Our righteousness, Jesus. The Alpha and the Omega, Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus. The living word, Jesus. An image of the invisible God, Jesus. We are able to see him. God is invisible without Jesus. Wisdom of God, Jesus, the brightness of his glory, Jesus, the way, Jesus, the truth, Jesus, the life, Jesus, the lamb, Jesus, the tree of life, Jesus, the bread of life, Jesus, the light of the world, Jesus, the bright and morning star, Jesus, the redeemer, Jesus, our strength, Jesus, our refuge, Jesus. King of kings, Jesus. Lord of lords, Jesus. King of peace, Jesus. King of glory, Jesus. The ancient of days, Jesus. He is Yahweh, the God who calls things that are not as though they were. That's in Romans 4, 17. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Acts, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives all life, breath, and all things. That's Acts 17, 24 and 25. God wants us to reach out for him and to find him. He wants us to know that he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. Acts 17, 28. Understand, not all people are sons of God. We are all creations of God, but we are not sons of God until we say, Dad, be my father. And he's willing, he's willing, he wants that. He wants to be the father of every human being, but he will never force adoption on anybody. So I want to finish with a little prayer that I wrote here that goes right along with the Lord's Prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is actually an instruction on how to pray. It's really not a prayer. It's an instruction on how to pray. And if you follow that instruction, here's what you get. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of your divine character. And although we are absent from you now, we know that one day we will leave this world and be in your holy presence. Until then, help us to be an expression of your will. Thank you for providing us with the things we need in order to live and grow in the world, knowing that you are working all things together for our good. And thank you for your gift of Jesus, without whom we would be slaves to our imperfect nature. And help us to remember that as we have received forgiveness, so should we expect or express forgiveness to others. Please help us to resist the seductions of our carnal nature and protect us from the great deceiver. For we acknowledge you, you, as our creator and almighty God. Amen. 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 Amen.